Well, we've got a treat this afternoon. For our mystery speaker for 2010, on the 25th anniversary of the Mises University, we bring you a man who is famous, but will be more famous still, a man who has accomplished so much through his writing and his extraordinary speaking, but will accomplish even more, a man who was a champion of civil liberties, of peace, of free markets, but will be an even greater champion in years to come, Help me welcome our most extraordinary speaker, a man who, by the way, makes normally huge speaking fees, but is coming here today as a gift to the Mises Institute and to you. Help me welcome this great man. I never got a reception like that in the courtroom. <laughs> Lou Rockwell is a, uh, a giant in the freedom movement, and each of you are budding giants, and I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted to be here. I was worried that if you didn't say who I was, you might not recognize me. <laughs> and as you may know, my uh, show for this Friday, Lou and I just taped together. He drove at the, before the sun came up this morning to uh, Montgomery to get to a television studio. Um, I thought that I would talk to you a little bit about the Constitution, about how it interacts with uh, our everyday lives, about how it affects the relationship of the government to the individual, and then I thought we'd get into a little conversation uh, ourselves. I should be able to read some of your name tags, and maybe I'll call on you for a couple of questions, and you can respond, and we can get a nice dialogue going. <clears throat> some men say the earth is round, and some men say it is flat. But if it is round, can a command of the parliament make it flat? And if it is flat, could the king order it to be round? These are the words used by St. Thomas More in defense of himself, representing himself in his own trial for high treason, in which he was accused, of course, of refusing to acknowledge that the king was the head of the church on earth. We all know the outcome. The government separated his head from the rest of his body. But when he was making this argument to the jury, he was, of course, appealing not only to their common sense. Of course the parliament couldn't make a round earth flat. And of course the king couldn't make a flat earth round. He was also appealing to their understanding of the natural law, of the order in things, of the way a divine creature or a force of nature, whether you are religious or secular, created things, and of our need to pursue happiness by complying with the law of nature. He knew what Aristotle and Augustine and Aquinas had written. He could almost anticipate what Locke and Jefferson would write. And Locke, of course, would repeat this, and Jefferson would repeat this as well, that we have natural rights, that they come from our humanity, that they don't come from the government. At least those were the arguments that uh, were made by these wonderful people who advanced this argument of the natural law. When we were a colony, when we were colonies, and the king and the parliament had wanted to raise money, they had ingenious ways of doing so. One of the most offensive was the Stamp Act. Parliament enacted a law that required every piece of paper in your home, every book, every pamphlet, every legal document, even a poster you were going to nail to a tree, have the king's image on it. You think it's rough going to the post office today? You had to go to a foreign post office and buy an image of the king. Question, how did the king and the parliament 3,000 miles away know if you had in your home the king's image and every piece of paper? Answer, Parliament enacted an abomination called the Townsend Acts, which authorized British soldiers to write their own search warrants. 
So a British soldier would show up at your house and knock on the door and hand you a piece of paper in which he had authorized himself to come in, ostensibly to look for the stamps. But of course, while there, they might help themselves to food, to alcohol, to furniture. They might even help themselves to the house, which is why we have the Third Amendment, which prohibits quartering troops in a private home against the wishes of the owner. The Stamp Act was really the last straw. It was the only one of the oppressive acts that Parliament actually repealed in an effort to quell the colonists from their rebellious ways. We fought a revolution. We won the revolution. We wrote a constitution. In 1787, they had a great debate, and the debate went back to what Moore said at his trial and what Locke had written and what Aristotle, Augustine, and Aquinas had written. Where do our liberties come from? Do they come from our humanity or do they come from the government? Hamilton and the big government people at, 17, at Philadelphia in 1787 said there can be no freedom without government. Government protects freedom and government knows when to restrict it and when to expand it. And as long as the government is subject to the will of the people, as long as the majority rules, freedom will be safe. Jefferson, who wasn't there but argued through Madison, and Madison directly argued that this was nonsense, that our freedom comes from our humanity, that our right to think as we wish, to say what we think, to publish what we say, to worship or not to worship, our right to defend ourselves, our right to keep and bear arms, our right to life, to liberty, to the pursuit of happiness, our right to be left alone. After the right to life, that's my favorite, the right to be left alone, that, the, that these, these rights come from our humanity. And rights either come from our humanity by virtue of the force of nature or our gifts from God. As he created us in his own image and likeness, as he is perfectly free, we are perfectly free. The argument went back and forth. If you meet, read Madison's notes, if you read Max Farrand, if you read any of the standard works which quote the debates in Philadelphia. We, we didn't win all those debates. We have a constitution that does have a Bill of Rights in it. It doesn't grant power. It restrains the government from exercising power. The Bill of Rights was written to restrain the federal government. Ultimately, it would be used in almost all instances to restrain all government. But there are uh, majoritarian impulses in the Bill of Rights which undermine the notion that our liberties come from our humanity. So let's think of a few of them. Everybody knows this phrase, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. What's the most important word? The. Why? It represents the understanding of the drafters that the freedom of speech pre-existed the government. It pre-existed them. It already existed before they assembled in 1787. It reflected in the simplest of ways their understanding that the freedom of speech did not come from anything they wrote or created in 1787, but rather was being recognized by them as something that they and their successors must respect. And so the First Amendment gives us the restraint on the Congress with respect to expressive liberties. Fast forward a couple of years, we have the presidency of John Adams, uh, during the course of the French Revolution, when the government is afraid of the French. And as a result of this bizarre fear of French people, <laughs> the government enacts the Alien and Sedition Acts, which basically says if you are French, you have to live here for 14 years before you can become a citizen. It also says if you bring the president or the Congress into disrepute, you can be prosecuted for a felony. How could the same generation, in some instances the very same human beings who wrote Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, also author something as abominable as the Alien and Sedition Acts? Lou, Lou Rockwell and I have spent a lot of time talking about this, and he reminds me of um, 
what Augustine wrote about when he talked about libido dominandi. Now, don't get excited. We all have libido. We all know what that is. This is a different kind of libido. This is, <laughs> this is the lust to dominate. This is the thing in human nature that draws people to the government. Regrettably, there are far too few Ron Pauls in the government and far too many people that suffer from this libido dominandi, this urge to dominate. So Congressman Matthew Lyon, an anti-federalist, a Jeffersonian from Vermont, thought that he would test the limits of the Alien and Sedition Acts. And he argued in public that John Adams, who was into puffery and pomp and circumstance and frills and wore almost regal-like clothing, in fact was more interested in pomp and circumstance than the government. That wasn't quite enough to provoke the Justice Department. But John Adams had a little problem with his waistline. I can understand that. <laughs> and Congressman Lyons referred to the president as his rotundity. <laughs> and that was the last straw for the Justice Department. So Congressman Lyons was indicted and charged as a sitting member of Congress. He didn't say it on the floor of the Congress. You know, if he had said it on the floor of the Congress, he couldn't be prosecuted because of a clause in the Constitution that insulates members of Congress from legal action against them for what they do and say on the floor. Uh, Patrick Kennedy was caught driving drunk at 3 o'clock in the morning and collided with a tree. Argued that he was on his way to the floor of the Congress at that hour and therefore couldn't be prosecuted for DUI. <laughs> the Constitution, constitutional protection of members of Congress doesn't go that far, but it does protect them for what they say on the floor. Congressman Lyons did not make this statement on the floor. He was charged, prosecuted, tried, and convicted of violating the Alien and Sedition Acts for making fun of the president's waistline. Now, if you're from New Jersey or New Orleans or Boston, you'll appreciate the second part of this story. Congressman Lyons ran for re-election from his jail cell. <laughs> and he won. <laughs> Eventually, of course, he returns to Congress. The Alien and Sedition Acts uh, expire. Uh, they were sunset. Jefferson, of course, as the vice president, wasn't even protected by them. Uh, as you remember how presidents were elected in those days, everybody ran for president. Whoever finished first became president in the Electoral College. Whoever finished second became vice president. So you had the big government, somewhat overweight, pompous John Adams, the Federalist, and the very slim icon of liberty, Thomas Jefferson, the Anti-Federalist, as the Vice President. Imagine the bizarre combinations today had this not been changed shortly after the calamitous election of 1800. So back to the debate in, in 1787. We'll, we'll look for a minute at the authoritarian impulses in the Constitution through the prism of property rights. We'll start with this premise from Hayek. If you accept the premise that individuals exist for the greater good of society or the nation, then all the horrible experiences of totalitarianism are logical and will follow. Question, does the Constitution of the United States preserve, protect, and defend individual natural rights or is it an instrument for totalitarianism? Now, you can answer this, I would argue, either way. We'll take the bad side for a moment. The argument is over eminent domain. When the king was the king in Great Britain, and he wanted property for his own purposes, he took it. He didn't have to pay for it. He didn't have to go to court. He just took it. Sometimes they would give the owner of the property some cash so that the owner would go away and leave the property peacefully. But the king as the sovereign had this power just to take the property. Fast forward to 1787 and they're trying to decide what to do with property rights, this new government that we're creating. Should it be able to take property? Madison, no. Jefferson, no. The only legitimate exchange of property for value is one that is truly voluntary. The individual is the highest good. The individual doesn't exist for the country. The country exists to protect the property rights of the individual, Jefferson and Madison's argument. Hamilton's argument is the one that the king made. Well, listen, we've got to build roads and canals. We've got to expand westward. We need a central bank. We need paper money. 
um, we're going to be able to have to take property. Why should we have to pay for it? It's the taxpayers' dollars anyway. So this argument went back and forth, and they crafted the Fifth Amendment. You could argue that the Fifth Amendment is a compromise. You could argue that it, it, it permits the exaltation of the state over the individual. It recognizes the right of the government to take whatever real property it wants, but it gives the owner of that property a jury trial and lets a jury decide what the value of the property is. And that's called eminent domain. So question, that right in the Fifth Amendment of the government to take property, does that, as Hayek warned us, manifest the belief that individuals exist for the greater good of the nation? I would argue regrettably that it does that if we truly are free, then our property is truly our own, and we can exclude anyone from it, even the government. That's not radical. That was the idea of most of the founders when they were breaking away from the king, and if you read what Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, those were his ideas as well. So the Fifth Amendment is an imperfect compromise. By establishing eminent domain, it establishes the prior right of the central government to take whatever property it wants. And in an eminent domain case, and I've tried these as a judge, the issue is not what does the government want the property for. The only issue is what is the value of the property. I remember trying a case once where the government took a farmer's field in order to deposit a debris on the field from a highway that they were building. This highway was about uh, 65 or 70 miles from New York City. The debris was about 800 or 900 feet high. It was a mountain in the farmer's backyard. And the government wanted to argue to the jury that if the farmer climbed to the top of the mountain, he'd be able to see New York City. So therefore, the debris that they had deposited on his property actually enhanced its value. <laughs> Unfortunately for them, I, wouldn't, I was the judge, and I wouldn't even let them make that absurd argument. But that's the length to which the government will go. But the issue of whether or not the government can do this, that is, take the backyard, it was an enormous backyard, it was 35 or 40 acres, and fill it with debris was never even reached. In an eminent domain case, property first, decision later. Property first, decision later. The government gets the property, and then... The courts decide later what it's worth. We know from the Kelo case that this has truly been uh, distorted now. The Fifth Amendment at least has in its protection public use that's now become public benefit. And Kelo says that a public benefit can be more tax dollars in the tax collector's coffers. How could that possibly be a benefit to give them more money to spend? You're at home one night, there's a knock on the door. You open the door, there's a guy with a gun. The guy says to you, give me your money. I want to give it away in your name. <laughs> you call the police. You find out he is the police. <laughs> now, if we wouldn't let a crackpot like that come into our living room to take our cash to give it away in our name, why would we let the government do that? When I tell this story and I argue that taxation is theft, my buddy Stossel says, you're killing me, you're killing me. I said, John, what do you mean I'm killing you? He said, well, when you say things like taxation is theft and the people that listen to you roar and love to hear you say it, my people say to me, well, John, why don't you say what Judge Napolitano says? <laughs> I shouldn't tell stories by myself. I'm, I'm awed at the uh, reception that you've given me and utterly uh, delighted to be here. This is the greatest academic institution on the planet for the study of human freedom, bar none. And you are all fortunate to be here. still hear me. This device is working. Okay. So we'll start with a couple of questions. Somebody want to make the argument, Jessica, that Hamilton was right and that without a government there can be no property rights and no liberty. 
And so we have to have the government to protect those property rights. The floor is yours. Whoa, uh, I think I was, I can't say that. I'm too nervous, I can't. All right, I'll help you out a little no. bit. This is, by the way, this is the way, this is the way law school is taught. The professor goes up and says, Todd, tell me why the court was wrong in Marbury against Madison. Oh, but professor, I just studied it. I can tell you what they said. Yeah, but I want you to rip it apart. All right, you, you have a seat. I don't, I, don't want a, I don't want an emotional problem here. University of Oklahoma, yes, John Chancey. Make Hamilton's argument. That, Make him sound good. That's impossible. Give it your best shot. Yeah, I got nothing. You got nothing. <laughs> Willie, give it your best shot. Uh, I'll, I'll give back to you. You'll give back to me. <laughs> Edward. Go ahead, Edward. Well, we no one's going to think you're a traitor. <laughs> Just give it your best shot. Well, uh, life is brutish, nasty, and short. We need a Leviathan government to uh, keep us all under control and keep us sleeping. All right. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> nice job. Jeremiah, where does your right to think as you wish come from? It's a natural right given to us by the fact that we are human. How do humans have this natural right? Uh, no. I, um... I'm glad that somebody said the creator, because you should be able to make both of these arguments. You should be able to make a religious argument and a secular argument. Here's the secular argument. I own my own body. I own what my body produces. I own the ideas that comes out of it. I, that come out of it, I own what I produce with the sweat of my brow. I own the thoughts that I express. I own the property and wealth that I accumulate. Or, I was created in the image and likeness of an all-knowing, all-loving God who is perfectly free. And as I am in his image and likeness, I have the freedom that he gave to me. Those two arguments meet at the position of true north. I shouldn't have both microphones. Hold that for me, Ted. And, and, and true north is the position that everybody in this room accepts, which is the primacy of the individual over the state. Obviously, we accept that as the starting point from which we study political philosophy, economic philosophy, and the relationship of the government to the individual. Who's got the microphone? All right, keep it, Ted. Why does the government reject that argument? Well, the government rejects the argument because they feel as though we would take those rights from each other if we didn't have someone to keep us in line and, and protect them for us. Is the government more interested in our freedom or its own power? Well, it wouldn't be able to exercise uh, its ability to protect our freedoms if it didn't have complete power over us, so I would say it's much more interested in its own power. How did it get this way? How did we get a government which can only pay lip service to the Constitution? I was interrogating this Congressman from uh, South Carolina, Jim Clyburn, the number three ranking Democrat in the House, about health care. And I said, Congressman Clyburn, very simple declaratory basic question. Where in the Constitution is the federal government authorized to manage health care? He looked at me as if I had three heads and said, <laughs> Judge, most of what we do down here, I was in New York, he was in Washington through the magic of Fox, it looked like we were in the same room, most of what... Most of what we do down here is not authorized by the Constitution. Now, <laughs> we, we all laugh at that. Everybody does every time I relate it, and you may, you may give him some credit for his honesty, but it's reprehensible. Congressman, do you remember that you took an oath to uphold the Constitution? Yes. But you tell me, he says, to continue the conversation, where in the Constitution it is prohibited. I'm just going to walk down the aisle. There we are, Matthew. Where in the Constitution it is prohibited for the federal government to manage health care. Now, that is the more serious of the two confessions because that reveals an utter misunderstanding of the Constitution and the nature of limited government. If he thinks that the federal government can do everything except that which is prohibited, then it can do almost anything it wants. In fact, of course, the federal government is limited if the Constitution means what it says, unless it's this sneaky majoritarian document intended to create totalitarianism when we have a dictator like Lincoln or, or Franklin Roosevelt or even, as 
cousin Theodore or the guys that have been in the White House in the past couple of terms. You'll have to decide for yourself whether the Constitution was written to permit that. But we know that at least as you read it, it is one of limited powers. Do you remember Reagan's first inaugural address? I know you do. <laughs> Who has a microphone? All right. In Reagan's first inaugural address in the third paragraph, I know you remember what he said. The states formed the federal government. Do you remember what he said? Um, the states formed the federal government. And not the other way round. Now, if your humble temporary professor had been the author of that speech, I would have added, and the power which the states gave to the central government, they can take back. They can even nullify. <laughs> Forgive me, those of you who are my generation, this is the smartest guy in the room. <laughs> they can even nullify what the federal government does, as you know, a concept readily accepted, articulated in the Declaration of Independence. If we can separate from Great Britain, why can't the part of the country that hates the central government separate from the rest? Makes sense to you? Makes perfect sense. Okay. Anybody else want to throw anything out at us? Sir? Judge, uh, I think you're an anarchist, but you don't know it yet. <laughs> do, we, do you hear me denying anything? I thought there was going to, going to be a follow-up. You know, I, I, I have uh, argued, some of you have heard what I've said, and some of you have read uh, what I've written, and some of you have seen me with Lou Rockwell and uh, with Tom Woods, that uh, the government exists for only one purpose, and that is to preserve our freedom. And everything else that the government does is illegitimate, immoral, not authorized, by the Constitution. When I was having this argument with, uh, with Congressman Clyburn, I made the, the Reagan statement that the young lady just reminded us what he said uh, in, his, uh, in his first inaugural address, but it was like, it was like talking to a stone. I mean, the, the Congress is so enamored of its own power. He even said to me, you know, Judge, we sometimes write laws, we don't care if they're unconstitutional. We leave it to you and your buddies with black robes uh, to decide if it's unconstitutional, and we win either way. If you say it is constitutional, we got a piece of the pie home. If you say it's not constitutional, we tried to get a piece of the pie home, and the voters will reward us. Now, Jefferson and Hamilton agreed on very little in their lives, but the one thing they did agree on is when the public treasury becomes a public trough, and when the public recognizes that, it will only send to Washington people who will give it the larger piece of the pie. And then nobody's liberties will be safe if the government takes the attitude that it can take whatever it wants. So then I said to Congressman Clyburn, well, you know, the, you want the federal government to micromanage health care. How well does the federal government do managing anything else? And he said to me, what do you mean? I said, well, Medicare broke. Medicaid broke, Social Security broke, the post office broke, Amtrak broke, the Defense Department broke. When the Mustang Ranch in Nevada was taken over by the IRS for failure to pay income taxes and the government ran it, they bankrupted it. <laughs> so let me get this straight, Congressman Clyburn. The government can't provide booze and hookers to truckers in the desert, and they want to manage health care. Here, here's, 
here's a, here's a little bit of good news, and it follows from the silly example I just gave. I don't think I could have made arguments like this in public 10 years ago or maybe even five years ago. If there's any uh, silver lining in the dark cloud of totalitarianism consuming Washington and extending its tentacles into our pocketbooks and our, and our private lives, it is that the argument for freedom is more compelling. The argument for freedom is reaching more people. The argument for freedom can be made in more uh, public uh, forums. I mean, Ron Paul was at one time um, a fringe candidate who was laughed at even by some of my colleagues at Fox. Oh my God, when they, excuse, when they excluded him from that fourth Republican debate, Fox got over 175,000 emails and every single one of them was copied to me. <laughs> uh, just imagine what that does to your inbox. But the argument for freedom made so articulately by Congressman Paul, the rest of us try to make the argument uh, that he makes on the national scale, resonates with so many young people and resonates with so many even middle class people, not the beneficiaries of the education that each of you have had, that Lou Rockwell has had, that Tom Woods has had, that I was uh, privileged to have, simply because the government has become so overbearing, so overweening, so disrespectful of the Constitution, so lacking in any uh, self-limitation that the argument for freedom is one that you can make more openly, more broadly, and it resonates more effectively than at any, any time that I can think of. The last time I remember arguments like this was probably before almost each of you was born. We had a classic uh, debate in this country in 1964 when Barry Goldwater ran against uh, Lyndon Johnson. And Goldwater had uh, authored a book called The Conscience of a Conservative. Don't shy away from it because a conservative then was a, was a classic. It was what we would call ourselves today. It's a, it's a wonderful book. There's some bizarre stuff about foreign policy, but basically about the nature of the relationship of the federal government to the states and to the individuals. It's, art, it's articulated brilliantly. Uh, that's the last time I can remember public debates about the Constitution like we have now. But the, the statements by Congressman uh, Clyburn are so deeply troubling because they have been accepted by so many people. I'll give you an example. I was interviewing Governor Palin uh, on my show, and I asked her the following question. Governor, you were the victim of a email hacker. He hacked into your computer, got your personal records, the government prosecuted him, tried him, and convicted him. Yes, right. <laughs> Question, Governor, should the government be able, hang on to that, John, should the government be able to hack into your email without a search warrant from a judge? Well, of course not. And any statute or any law in the books that says that it can has got to come right off those books. Seated next to me, she was in Utah on a screen about this size in the studio. Seated next to me was Congressman Paul, who said, I'm one of just 16 Republicans that voted against the Patriot Act. He could have said, but he's a gentleman and didn't, that she campaigned for when she ran with John McCain. So, does a person's attitude about freedom change when they are the victim? Or did she not know that the Patriot Act authorizes federal agents to write their own search warrants? You can decide for yourself which is the appropriate answer. But that that phrase, combined with one I'll tell you about uh, in a moment, went viral. You know, a lot of people picked it up uh, all over the internet because, you know, Palin attacks the Patriot Act. Then I said to her, Governor, is it any business of the government what chemicals we put into our bodies when we are at home, in the privacy of our homes, and when no one is harmed by it? And she goes, you talking about marijuana? Yes. <laughs> I don't think it should be legal, but I don't think it should be prosecuted. What? <laughs> right. What is exactly what I said. That, of course, went viral. Palin in favor of legalization of marijuana. 
sometimes when you, when you present arguments in a way that, uh, that emphasize the ignominy of the government and natural freedoms, people will accept those arguments, forgive me, without even realizing what they're saying. I don't know what her thoughts uh, were when she said that, but when, if, you, if you are before groups or in front of the camera, you, you need to understand ways to make these arguments so that the government is shown as the destruct, destroyer of freedom that it is, and the individual is shown as being, uh, having primacy over the government. Now, it's not always easy to do that. Uh, I spend about every Sunday afternoon, I don't have the time to, to do this during the week, so I have somebody on my staff make a copy, download everything that's on lourockwell.com. And my favorite part of the week is Sunday afternoon, just going through two thick loose, loose leaves, because I don't like to read it on the screen, of everything that's on there. You know this because you're all here. These are just some of the greatest arguments for human freedom that you can imagine. They're, they're treats from Murray... Rothbard, to Hayek, to Lou himself, to Tom Woods, to a lot of people all over the country that share and enjoy the ideas uh, that we do and help you to make your point. So, how many ways are there to earn wealth? I can think of three. One is the inheritance model. You're fortunate enough to have inherited a lot of money God bless you, spend it as you want. The other is the economic model, with, which is what most of us use. You work hard, you trade a skill, knowledge, sweat of your brow, the work of your muscles, the creation of your brain to somebody else who pays you for it. And the third is the intimidation model. Your money or your life. Which model does the government use? It's not even a close call. So when you can explain things like that, I learned a lot of this from Woods. When you can explain things like that, people understand exactly what's happening here. You, you may not talk about the majoritarian impulses of the, of the Fifth Amendment. If you're a scholar of the Constitution, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But when you tell people, the government can take anything it wants from you, no matter how badly you want to keep it, as long as it throws an adequate amount of money at you. Most people would object to that. If you go up to somebody and say, do you want to live your life as you wish, or do you want the government to tell you how to live it? Now, that's a question that really only has one answer. I don't even know how Congressman Clyburn would answer a question like that. But you, you have to confront the adversary and put that question to them and bring these things that government does to us right down to the basics of who makes the decisions in our lives. All right, questions. You ready to make Hamilton's argument? Not yet. All right, all right, we'll get there. Yes, in the pink shirt right here. What'd you do, shave with a credit card this morning? <laughs> I'm just being a wise guy. Go ahead. Judge, when the principle of freedom and the Constitution, when they conflict, which one should be paramount to U.S. justices who swore to uphold the Constitution? What's more important, the freedom or the Constitution? Almost everybody uh, who was a judge in the country today would probably answer the Constitution. But I would argue that the Constitution embodies the natural law, and it is the duty of judges to uphold the natural law no matter what the majority says. The whole purpose of an independent judiciary is to be the anti-democratic branch of government. What do I mean by that? The anti-democratic, lowercase d, branch of government. Wait a minute. To, to be the... Uh, oh, they brought the mic. Thank you. <laughs> to be the branch of government that's not decided by majoritarian vote, but has its own uh, authority on what's right and wrong. Why do we want an anti-democratic branch of government? I thought the majority rules, Joshua. Because if the majority rules, it can steal the rights of the minority? Pre precisely. Because if we did not have an anti-democratic branch of the government, there would be nothing to prevent the majority from taking the property or the freedom of the, minor of the minority by a simple vote. 
Hitler was elected pursuant to the laws that existed in Germany at the time by some sort of a majority vote. No one could seriously argue that simply because the majority has voted for something that it is worthy of protection in our hearts or by the use, I'm getting back to your great question earlier, of our courts. So there should be no question in anyone's mind that the duty and the affirmative obligation of the courts is to protect natural liberty. Who on the Supreme Court of the United States today comes closest to doing this? Thomas. Justice Thomas, and it's not even close. Unfortunately, he's only one of eight. Every once in a while, you'll hear something from my friend Nino, but for the most part, Justice Thomas is the only person who writes about, in, in judicial opinions, the natural law, and it is, it's, it's restraint on the government. That's the beauty of the natural law when it is recognized is it restrains everything except personal freedom. Uh, speaking of the Supreme Court, Judge, uh, when President Paul nominates you to the Supreme Court, <laughs> will you accept and how will you handle the smell? <laughs> we haven't discussed it. <laughs> Very flattering. Somebody else wants to stir the pot. Sir, Paul, pass that down to him. You're welcome. Um, during the um, uh, con uh, Constitutional Convention, uh, when the Constitution was first ratified, the state delegates came over and they ratified the Constitution, which means, I think, that the federal government has power over the states, not the people, in the states, correct? To a extent. Here's, here's what I would say, and I think it's a great argument. The third word of the Constitution is highly misleading. What is it? People. It was we, the states, that enacted the Constitution. It was not we, the people. The Constitution was ratified by ratification conventions in each state. It didn't matter whether a state had 50 ratifiers or 10,000 ratifiers. Until the Civil War, the federal government had next to no relationship to individuals from and after the abominations of Reconstruction, when you needed in the South, right where we are now, permission from a, a federal military person to go to the post office, to be outside with your spouse, to play a game in public with your children. It was a dictatorship for 10 years from 1865 to 1876, 11 years. Um, the, the government began having a relationship with individuals. Uh, Lincoln enacted, the Congress enacted at Lincoln's instigation, legal tender laws. The Congress enacted an income tax, which eventually uh, went away. But the presumption that the federal government had authority over individuals without a scintilla of authority in the Constitution for it was accepted. Why? Wartime. I once sang that Springsteen song on air, which of course got me a call from the second floor, which is where the executives of Fox are. <laughs> war, war, what is it good for? The government. Because war is the health of the state. Because presidents... <laughs> when they want your money and your freedom, will start a war. Lyndon Johnson practically acknowledged that in public with all of his gooey adulation of FDR and his uh, willingness to emulate him. So this is sort of a long-winded answer. I mean, in the progressive era, with the destruction of states' rights and with the institution of the income tax, the, seven, the 16th and the 17th amendments, the federal government begins a very, very direct contact with individuals by going into your pocket by thinking it can take as much as, oh, don't worry, the tax will never be more than about three and a half or five percent, and it'll only affect the wealthiest people. At one point, it went up to 90 percent. So, you know, you give them that authority, and they'll take it. I am so offended by this amendment, which destroyed the ability of the states to send senators to the, Cong uh, to the Congress and allowed the voters to elect them, that I think you can answer this bizarre-sounding question. Question. Is there any part of the Constitution that is unconstitutional? <laughs> Answer, it is this amendment. It is the 16th Amendment 
that destroys the ability, that takes the states away from the table of government. Here's the table of government. The people are there in the House of Representatives. The state is there in the president. The states are there in the Senate. Do you think Chuck Schumer would still be representing New York if the state legislature sent him there? Probably not, because most of what he does doesn't have anything to do with the power and independence and sovereignty of the state of New York. So that is an absolute abomination. As, as horrendous as the income tax is, it is that one in the progressive era that began the utter destruction of the tripartite system of government that the founders gave us. I can't see your name from this instance. Matt. Matt. I just wanted your opinion on what if the uh, founders... Here you go, Matt. All right, here you go. What if the Constitutional Convention had never ratified the Constitution and we'd still be with the Articles of uh, Confederation? How would, how would this nation or how would this population grow? How would it be different than it is today, do you think? We wouldn't have a Federal Reserve. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, we wouldn't have a president who thinks he can be a king. We wouldn't have a Congress that thinks it can write any law, regulate any activity, tax any event. We'd be happier and freer. I'm, I'm projecting, of course. <laughs> You're asking me to rewrite 230 well, years I, of I history. I just wanted a brief, in other words, yeah. better or worse. Oh, not, not even a close call. Look, I, I, I spend my professional life studying and defending the Constitution. But I didn't write it. I mean, I would have written a lot of different things, and, and the Articles of Confederation uh, created a system of government which permitted the states to nullify, to tell the federal government uh, to take a hike, which literally was based on the consent of the governed. All right, Jessica, let's see what you do with this one. Is the government based on the consent of the governed? Does the government get its power from the consent of the governed, or does it get it from some other source? Right. Oh, it should. Okay, so where's the microphone? Okay, suppose, suppose you don't consent. Does the government still have power over you? Um, I think now they do. I don't think that they should. Oh, but good argument. Good argument. Yes, they do. They really don't care about your consent. So is the argument that the powers of the government are based on the consent of the government, just a bunch of baloney made by politicians who want to steal your property and your freedom? Probably is. Sometime during his administration, uh, George W. Bush claimed that he got powers as president from, <laughs> this is crazy, from some source other than the Constitution. And when pressed, he couldn't name the source. <laughs> Perhaps because it doesn't exist. But uh, he didn't say from the consent of the governed. You know, if you, if you read things, if you read portions of the Declaration of Independence, I've argued with people on air about this, who will say, oh, it was just Jefferson's musings. But he just wrote that to antagonize the king. He just put that down to, to rile people up so that they would, would rebel against Great Britain. All right, if you go to the U.S. Code, which is all the laws the Congress has ever written, it would fill bookshelves about this size, this, this whole corner here. Go to the first page of the first book, and what's there? The first law they ever adopted, the Declaration of Independence. Yet in New Jersey, when Woodrow Wilson was president, he had just been the governor of New Jersey, people were arrested for reading the Declaration of Independence out loud on public street corners especially the part that says when the government fails to protect your freedom, it is the duty of the people to alter or abolish it. How could you possibly be prosecuted for that? Wilson was, of course, a monster who brought the progressive era to us. I'm a graduate of Princeton University where he is utterly revered but his ideas that the federal government could write any law that it wanted and tell you how to live your life really was the progenitor of the big government we have today, I would argue even more so than FDR. Had there not been a Woodrow Wilson, again, I'm rewriting history here, uh, there might not have been an FDR or he might not have been as successful as he was. During World War I, the government enacted the Espionage Act which made it a crime to discourage someone in the munitions industry from going to work or to discourage someone who had been drafted from going into the military. What's the word? Discourage. 
so it punished speech. So Abe Gitlow, an immigrant from Eastern Europe, you guys don't remember this, but when I was your age, before printers and laptops and blackberries and all the gizmos and wizards we have today, if you wanted to get an idea out, even Woods is too young to remember this, you got an old-fashioned mimeograph machine. It was like a barrel filled with ink, and you put a stencil on the outside of it. If you turned it at the right speed and you caught the right amount of papers, the ink would seep through the cuts on the stencil, and you could reproduce documents cheaply and in your home. So Abe reproduced a very crude pamphlet that basically said this World War I, then call it World War I, the Great War is insane, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't participate in it. You shouldn't help it in any way. And then he took these, and he went to the top of the tenement in which he lived in lower Manhattan, and he hurled them into the streets. And five years later, he began serving a 20-year prison term for violating the Espionage Act by discouraging people from participating in the war effort. Government was not able to find anybody at trial who would come and testify that they saw, read, or understood Abe's leaflets. Abe, you see, didn't speak English, and he wrote them in Yiddish, <laughs> and forgot that with the exception of his mother and mother-in-law, very few people around there even understood the language, much less the alphabet that was used for it. That is still a law today. When the New York Times revealed that the Bush administration was spying on us without warrants and lying about it, that brilliant Secretary of State, Alberto Gonzalez, threatened to prosecute them under the Espionage Act. The Alien and Sedition Act's expired. The Espionage Act is still there. Well, if the government gets its powers from the consent of the governed, who could possibly consent to the existence of a crime for discouraging people? Anybody? Nobody? So again, we go back to where we started. And it may be an unhappy argument, except that we're all very happy to be here. Is the Constitution an instrument that ultimately protects our freedom, that ultimately preserves the primacy of the individual over the state? Or is the Constitution an insidious instrument by which the majority can always get its way. And by majority, I don't mean the people that vote in November. I mean the Jim Clyburns, and the Republicans are just as bad at this as we know from the Bush administration, the Patriot Act was their, their creation. I mean the majority of those who run the government. Well, both, neither, either one. Look, this is like how many angels are on the head of a pin? We're, we are not going to come to an answer to this now. I throw this out to you not to express any personal exasperation or, or any frustration with the document, but I throw it out to you because you ought to be thinking about these things. As well as each of you understands Austrian economics, you need to understand how the government came to exist, how the government operates, and what it claims it can do. Boy, if the world were filled with young people like this, we wouldn't have these things to worry about. Jefferson. Well, Jefferson was far, far from perfect. I mean, we all know about his personal life. At the same time, he wrote that all men are created equal. He probably was having a relationship with one of his 200 slaves, and she probably had six or seven children by him who can imagine that her re in involvement with him uh, was voluntary. And the Constitution, of course, as originally written, has three clauses in it that implicitly recognize slavery. So obviously, it is a flawed document. But if you take the Bill of Rights for what it is supposed to be, if you understand the Declaration of Independence as the protector, progenitor, explainer of our natural rights, and the Constitution of the United States as the explainer of how the government is supposed to protect those rights. These things should work well. They don't, and they haven't, 
because not enough people understand the ways in which government takes freedom away from people. When Justice uh, Scalia was Judge Scalia, when Joe Biden was Senator Biden, they had the following discourse back and forth at Justice Scalia's confirmation hearings when President Reagan nominated him to the Supreme Court. Biden, well, would you read what we members of Congress say about legislation in order to discern what we mean by it? Scalia, no. Are you interested in what lawyers call legislative history and all the committee reports that we prepare whenever we enact any legislation, Judge Scalia? Scalia, no. Don't you want to know the reasons why we vote in favor of legislation to preserve the American people? Scalia, there's only one reason why you vote for anything, Senator Biden, to get reelected. It doesn't matter what you say. That's the only reason that you people in government do anything. What is it called? Libido dominandi. We're back to where we started. The lust to dominate. The only thing that these people fear is the loss of their power. Jefferson, when the people fear the government, there is tyranny. When the government fears the people, there is liberty. God bless you, my friends. Thank you. For a good sport. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Great question. Thank you.